And we are live. It is a very, very good afternoon to everyone. In South Africa, anyway, it's 5 p.m. Uh, that's Central African time. Thank you so much for joining us on this special, special um, mentorship uh, Mondays on a center myself there. We uh, today are just so pleased uh, that we have been able to invite and get uh, a positive response from one of the women who is an absolute inspiration to me, um, whose life I, I look at and whose journey I use as a benchmark of what's possible uh, for women and for black women more broadly. Uh, Puti, thank you very much for being here. We really, really appreciate you. No, thank you very much, Nozipo. I appreciate it. Now, let's, let me just share a little bit about how Mentorship Mondays works, Puti, so that you can yeah. uh, understand when we're getting uh, some questions from our community. So over a year ago, uh, yeah. we started playing around with this idea that maybe, just maybe, um, mm -hmm. we could get access and make... Uh, people like yourselves who are extraordinary leaders, um, accessible to a whole lot more people around the world um, yeah. as mentors. And we started piloting uh, this idea. And so this is episode 48 um, wow. that we are on. We've had 48 yeah. mentors from around the world doing exactly yeah. what you're doing. And that is just coming and sharing some insights, imparting. And we typically will always have a range of people from different countries are joining us. And so this is the first time we're doing it on LinkedIn. And so okay. we are piloting again, but we're really excited uh, that you're here. So Betty, I see that you've already sending us some hearts in the chat. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And of course, if anybody else is here, let us know who you are and where you're joining us from. So excellent. Putty, I'm, I'm going to start off with a question that I think we actually hadn't planned to ask. And that is, if you were to think of yourself as a billboard and that billboard captures um, maybe in a sentence or two, who Putty is in essence, what do you think that billboard would say? I should have a seat at the table. Oh, I love that. I should have a seat at the table. And yeah. we're going to unpack that because I think when we begin to have these conversations, there's just so much depth in there. If the billboard is, I'm going to actually write it down. I yeah. should have a seat at the table. Already what we're hearing in there is um, I might not have a seat. Um, yeah. And some certain things need to change in order for me to have a seat. And so I think in our conversation, we're going to keep coming back to this idea of the seat. But let's start from the beginning. And I just want to say thank you so much to everybody who's joined. I'm getting so much excitement. Uh, Puchi, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, uh, but no. there are people from all <laughs> over. They're saying, oh, my goodness, yeah. I'm joining from Pretoria. I'm joining from Joburg South. Um, I'm joining from Kenya. We're all logged in here from Ghana. Uh, Canelo oh, says, please you. don't forget about me in Cape Town. So welcome, yeah. welcome, welcome, welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for, for being here. Putty, I want to start at the beginning. Yeah. I want us to go all the way to the way you were parented. Because if there's one thing we're learning, how yeah. we're parented and the kind of family structure, environment, the tone of the conversations within our families determines whether we think we should have a seat at certain tables or not. What, what is it about your upbringing that you think has shaped who you are today? Well, um, I think firstly, I'm, I'm hugely thankful to my parents for the liberated approach that they had to our upbringing. So um, as an example, um, my parents didn't go to church. So we would be those kids that would go with the neighbors and then we'd pretend like that the neighbors were our parents so that it wouldn't look odd to have these kids being in church without their parents. <laughs> but... Um, I think it was a, a good thing in that my parents um, created the space for us to be able to find Christianity in a meaningful way. Um, and so mm. I became born again while I was studying for my first degree in the U.S. And I've never looked back. Um, I think my belief in God has really gotten me through tough relationships, tough or bad career, uh, career choices or experiences. Um, and it has always been my relationship with God that has really just helped me to get through stuff. Um, and I think beyond that, um, there are many things that have happened in my life that have made logical sense. 
Um, but yeah. there's also an incredible amount of things that have happened that have not made logical sense. Um, and, you know, I, I can only put it down to, you know, just the goodness of just, you know, being blessed uh, by God. Yeah. And um, it has, it, and that's really just underpinned um, my belief. Um, and that belief that, you know, that I'm here for a reason, um, just like every single one of us is is here for a reason, whether we are able-bodied or not. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's it's for us to to make ourselves to count. And as I mentioned before, yeah. having that seat at the table. Um, and I'm very glad to have had a dad who made sure that I had that seat at the table. Every time yeah. my dad was invited to attend events, he went with me as, as a teenager. I was attending events where, like, I mean, I remember meeting President Mbeki as a teenager, and um, I met, you know, CEOs of listed companies as a teenager. Um, and it was through attending events with my dad. He just believed that I belonged. And so, yeah. and so I did. Yeah. Yeah. And isn't that amazing that he normalized um, ownership of having that seat? He normalized yeah. being in these spaces for you so that. You could walk tall and confident and actually demand your seat because this is what you were used to. This is what you were surrounded by. One of the things you've said, and I, and I, and I just, it check, actually took me back to the very first time I met you. And you yeah. might not remember this, but I was, I was tasked by CNBC Africa to come and interview you for yeah. an article on Forbes Africa. And okay. one of the first things you spoke to me about, and at that time you were still at Shanduka, you spoke yeah. to me about your love for God. Yeah. And it's so, it's so, as you speak, as you bring that back again, I can almost, I'm almost taken back to that moment because of the authenticity with which I felt it then and I felt it now. Can yeah. you take us to one illogical moment, a moment where a person like me has no business being in this space, has no business achieving that, but because I'm covered, I am here. You mentioned yeah. that you had logical moments and illogical moments. Give us one illogical moment that made no sense, but through the grace of God was possible. Well, I think, for instance, the opportunity to go and, and work for this firm in the States, um, they didn't want me to join them, and they said that to me. <laughs> Feedback but in the I, belly. <laughs> exactly. But I just didn't take the no. I just kept on being an irritation. And then um, they offered an internship. And because I was already in a management role, it didn't, it seemed illogical for me to go from being in a management role to taking on an internship. Um, and but I did because I believed that this was a break that I needed to have a different type of experience to be able to put my career on a different pedestal. And sometimes mm. it's something that you need to do. Sometimes you need to take a little bit of a step back to be able to take a big jump forward. Um, mm. And so I, I did that and it, it really, it, it, it was incredible. I mean, it didn't make sense. There I was then in the States um, and I was doing this internship with young people who had just graduated. I had my MBA, I had already been working and there I was, you know, but I was, I just, I had this belief that this would work for me. And because I had this belief, I, I put everything into it. I was working like late hours, but I was also having lots of fun, you know? Um, and in those years being in my twenties, I could like go from being in a nightclub to being in the office at 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> And bright-eyed, <laughs> you know. And bushy-tailed, um, right? And bushy-tailed, yeah, ready for it, you know. Um, but it was just this belief that this was going to propel me forward. And thankfully, it did, you know. But it it did take, it wasn't easy. I mean, um, being respected and being accepted uh, mm -hmm. by both senior and, you know, professionals at, at my level was not easy uh, because I was different. I was this young African um, they, yeah. they didn't have anybody from the African continent in that firm. It was all, only Americans who came from Ivy League universities. So I was just a weird person. I came, I didn't come from an Ivy League university and I was an African. So it was, but I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that um, through my youth, I had the ability to be very brave 
Um, yeah. I, I, believe, I think as, as the older we get, the less brave we are, and that's because we have a lot more to lose. Um, but I, I'm thankful that um, I, I was able to get through it. Yeah. Sure. Um, I just want to firstly just acknowledge a couple of people who have just been sending us so much love. Um, Bronwyn Nielsen uh, is watching. Oh, and Bronwyn, so that means you're next. That means you're next. We must, we must have you. Um, yeah. I've actually got a message from Petronella who says, I'm watching this with my teenage daughter and oh, absolutely wow. loving it already. Um, yeah. We've already had um, somebody who says, I'm watching from Oxford. So thank you yeah. for being here. But Puti, you've said quite a number of things in that response. Yeah. Yeah. So in taking us to that illogical moment where this yeah. African girl with no one who looks like her decides that I'm going to give up the management yeah. role in the management position and I'm going to take what seems so illogical and go and take the internship. Let yeah. me ask you this question. How have you, since that moment and other moments, handled being different? Because I'm sure you've been weird it, many times, weird yeah. as a young woman, weird as yeah. a black woman, weird, weird as a woman with voice, intellect, confidence. There, there aren't many spaces that are designed for people who look like us to step in and feel like they belong. How do you engage with being different in mm. spaces that don't look like you? And how do you use your difference positively well, well, and to progress you? Yeah, well, well, I'm I'm glad that I had these experiences that I had as a young person because I think for all of us women, irrespective of our race, it's important that we're able to to step out there and and to be confident and to believe in ourselves and to take on the opportunities that come our way, um, and so you know that that has really helped me to be able to look less at the fears and you know concerns, but to to believe that. Um, I, I can, if given an opportunity and, and having the support that I can be able to uh, to propel forward. So, mm. you know, it is just that inner belief um, because many times when you get opportunities, um, it's an opportunity that you may never have had. Um, and it's someone that is taking a risk um, on you being able to achieve that. And so, you know, you, you need to be able to have the confidence that you will be able to achieve if you are able to have the right support and to be able to grow in that particular area and put in what's required for you to be able to become familiar with, with whatever work it is. Mm. So yeah. you de-risk the risk that's been taken on you. I also don't want us to lose the comment you made about how we lose our bravery as we yeah. get older. And I, and I won't go into that now, but I'm hoping somebody is hearing that and is feeling positively challenged to relocate their bravery and to make yeah. sure that they don't lose it in the moment. Puti, I want yeah. to go to put what is from the outside looks like a very painful part of your life, losing your mom um, at a relatively young age. I think you were 17. So critical yeah. age when it comes to sort of your formative years. Yeah. And the, the next part of my question is quite intentional. What did you gain from living with that loss? Because I think sometimes when we gay engage with loss, we don't sometimes pause to think that there's something that is built, a muscle that's built because of that loss. What would you say you've gained because of that loss? Sure. So, so it's a difficult uh, question to, to respond to. But thinking about it, um, I think one of the things that I gained um, was an independent mindset. Um, mm. Because um, I, I knew that I, I needed to to be able to achieve uh, the things that I was setting out to be able to achieve, and um, to do that, I, I needed to have a certain level of of independence. Um, my self confidence was important, and I was had been very fortunate um, as a grade four um, student to um, have a great teacher, Mrs. Nix, whom I continue to to be friends with, um, and you know, and and also to continue to have a key focus on becoming successful because I had lost my mom when she was still so young. I I wanted to be successful so that she could achieve what she had wanted to achieve with me so that I could achieve what I wanted to achieve for myself. And um, yeah, and, and also to make my dad proud as well. So yeah, it, it gave me that sense of independence. I didn't have, I didn't have that sense of a fallback. 
you know, yeah. it, it was either going to make it or not. That was the kind of mentality that, that I had. So I, I had to. I'm, I'm trying so hard not to locate myself and center myself, myself in your story. But as you speak, you know, there's just so much resonance. So, you know, yeah. I lost my mom while I was, you know, moderating a live televised um, uh, conversation. And it, what I gained from that, Puti, was also realizing that I, I have... I have the muscle to do anything and to push through the hardest things because I had to complete what I had started in that moment. And so yeah. thank you for sharing the gift of that loss, the independence uh, that, yeah. came, that came with it. But also I resonate so much with this idea of not having a fallback. Um, yeah. I often tell the story that, um, you know, I, I, I had no fallback. So yeah. I had to pass everything first time. And so exactly. as an adult, I'm having to relearn that it's okay to fail because yeah. it's wired in me from a young age that you don't have the room to fail. So maybe yeah. let me ask you that question. Mm -hmm. How have you then recalibrated some of that? I mean, if you think about people who grow up with no fallback, you have one yeah. shot and one shot only. And suddenly you find yourself in a world where you not only as a leader have to show that you are vulnerable, that you can make mistakes, that you can mm -hmm. fail, but you have to give permission to other people to believe the same. How have you recalibrated some of that for yourself? I think what, one of the times when I had to recalibrate it was when I had the stroke um, mm. and all within a matter of like, you know, hours, I went from being able to remember transactions and things like it just being able to have so much information in my head to suddenly not having the capacity to remember anything, not even people's names, not even names of people that I knew. Um, and so that that was a, a, a real moment of recalibration um, in terms of my personal relationships, my professional relationships, um, the, the manner in which I engaged, the, the way that I invested myself. I think sometimes when we are very hungry in our pursuit, um, in our careers, as, as certainly I was very, very hungry in, in my pursuit for the things that I wanted to achieve, um, we can forget ourselves. We can forget mm. the fact that we, we actually need to be able to, to eat properly, to sleep sufficiently, to take care of our health, you know, um, and, and not treat ourselves as if we're these, uh, like, you know, entities that... Machines, that, yeah. Yeah, these machines that can never be affected. Um, and so, you know, and so that was um, a, a moment um, of, of real recalibration, um, personally and professionally. Sure. Thank you for sharing uh, with us mm -hmm. and thank you for, for reminding us um, that humanity starts with ourselves, right? Yeah. And I'm yeah. interested, you know, having had that um, health experience, what has it meant for your personal operating model? So what would Putty do differently today as she gets up and goes about the business of impacting the world that she would have done differently to what, the way you would have done it before? Well, I think um, I would have been a little bit kinder <laughs> to myself. Um, so as, as an example, I remember that when I was 25, um, I, I, um, I wanted to, to cons I, I was, you know, I, there was a part of me that wanted to consider going the chartered accountant route. Um, and I, I felt that at 25, I already had my MBA and, uh, you know, and, and I, I felt that it, it was too late. I was too old, you know, um, and it was that thing of us uh, constantly um, just criticizing ourselves that, you know, you're too old for this. Mm -hmm. uh, things like that I, I, I could have done. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's weird how I actually had the experience at that time of a colleague uh, leaving the company that we were both working for. Um, to go and become a medical doctor. She decided she was going to go to med school. Um, and we were both 25 then. But it still didn't occur to me that you can still go and try, you know, this, this uh, adding this profession to, 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 to yourselves. So I would have been, I would have had more um, belief um, and, and um, been a bit more kinder to myself because I kind mm. of, had like, I had like a timetable 
<laughs> it was like, by this age, I must have done this. By this age, I must yeah. have done that. And then there was the thing also with, with, with marriage. I, I, I believe mm. that it was important that I get married quickly so I could get that out of the way. <laughs> <Bad talk. laughs> yeah. So by the time I was 23, I was married um, and it was a bad call, you know. Um, and and, and, and uh, one of the other things was that because I was so married to my career, the idea of being on maternity leave for me was like, it had to be, the timing had to be absolutely perfect. I had to be perfect. I had to be pregnant at the perfect time so that I could be back at the perfect. So I couldn't miss out. The idea was not to miss out. <laughs> I, I feel so exposed. I feel like you're reading the file that my therapist has of yeah. me because yeah. you know, when you talk about the timetable, um, yeah. You know, the biggest breakthrough for me actually was last year, Puchi, where yeah. I actually met my favorite poet, David White, and I asked him, and I was I was like eight months pregnant at the time, and I was still yeah. going to this event with my big stomach, and yeah. I was still trying to figure out, you know, how I'm going to make this all work. And he said to me, yeah. the best gift you can give yourself is yeah. to leave yourself alone. Wow. And I remember going, and he said, he said in addition to that, he said, the, the, the checklist is only a resurgence of all the things you meant to do yesterday. Oh. And it actually has got nothing to do with the day that you're about to have. So oh. let it go. And, oh. you know, I'm still not there yet. Um, wow. I'm still not leaving myself alone enough. I'm still yeah. listing every now, now and then. But as you speak, yeah. it's, it is, it's, that, it's exactly that to say, how do we, how do we, how do we, pursue the lives that we want but to also to do it in a way that's kind um a way that is shows belief that's balanced with kindness um and actually doesn't put your life in a timetable because the absolutely. timetable doesn't hold absolutely but you're doing better than me nozipo because you've now got your baby and you're a mom you know honestly you you can't you know i look i look at women like mpumi madisa the group CEO of Bidvest. I look at yes. Leila Puri, the CEO of the JSE. I look at Mary Villagazi, the group CEO of First Rand. These are women who are mothers. So yeah. they've had to be on maternity leave a couple of times, actually, for these women. And yet they've still come back and they are leading significant yes. organizations in our country. You know, so, you know, and 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 this is despite the fact that you know it, the opportunities are so 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 little mm. as we know i mean you know when you look at the number of 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 women that we have on on the jse as directors you know they, they it's still minute i mean right now we have uh, 35% of of um, women directors on JSC listed companies, yeah. um, so you know it's it's it, we still have some way to go. Certainly, if we want to be in line with the number of women that are economically active in our country, we have forty six percent of women that are involved as you know were e economic participants um, in, in in our economy. But and yet the, the the numbers of women on boards is not aligning to that. So. You know, there's, there's, there's still, uh, yeah, it's, it's a long way to go, but you, you're doing very well. You're doing very well. <laughs> no, thank you. you. <laughs> you've, yeah. opened, you've opened a can of worms, and I'm going to go there. But before I do that, I do want to yeah. say to everybody who's watching, send me your questions. Um, let me, don't let me uh, keep putting it to myself. Uh, I have questions that we've, of course, received from all of you. But if there's a really interesting question that you'd like to put, pop it in the chat and then I'll see what I can do with it. But, mm. you know, as you speak, Puti, maybe there's two things I want to say. The first one is I mm. want to share a name. The name is a woman called Faith Kip Yegon. Kip okay. Yegon, K-I-P-Y-E-G-O-N. Yeah. She is a, an, an 800 meter a sprinter from Kenya who got yeah. faster after having her babies. Wow. And every time, you know, we go to this conversation, I'm reminded about, and I'm so glad the woman you list, Umpu, me, Sis Mary, um, mm. yourself, so many others, that mm. motherhood seems to enhance our yeah. ability to lead others rather yeah. than take away. And yeah. yet we're still seeing the motherhood penalty in play. And hence yeah. the numbers, you know, that yeah. you've spoken to. Let me yeah. ask, let me ask a different question because I know um, 
it's 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 this is going to be a a question that it really helps us tap into the things that we still need to table when we put when we grab our seats at the table yeah if anybody googles you there's a long list of awards and recognition behind your name you've been yeah. celebrated for excellence many times over in your view what are the things that we still have to celebrate women for that we've maybe missed when we count the things that matter and the things that are worth celebrating there are certain things i sometimes feel that women do so well but because they're not the the traditional things that we celebrate we miss them and we don't have awards for them so if you mm-hmm. could come up with different uh, an additional set of awards for women what would you what would you put on there that women are doing and are not getting recognition for i think there's a lot that we do in our personal capacities um in in the communities that we are in in the environments that we are in um and you know a, a, a lot that 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 we believe in and um you, you typically wouldn't hear of it because it's not things that you you do because you want a recognition for it but it's because you you're connected to it and you believe in it um and so you know i and 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 yet it is so important it is so critical um because we are members of of all of these uh, communities um i think it is also what we've just spoken about in terms of women being able to be significant players um in in their families play significant roles in their families but also play significant roles in in corporates as well as are men and men you know and 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 you know there are so many men today who are are playing really meaningful roles in their families as well as um in corporates or in running their own businesses and so you know i think there 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 are a number of these things that are unspoken and yet yeah. are so important um that that we we all um are are playing and mm. so yeah yeah that's yeah and and i suppose put it it's actually one of those things that women are really good at the ability yeah. to see the things that are typically unseen and yeah. the ability to bring to light and to celebrate the things that are typically hidden and don't yeah. have the spotlight um yeah. and again it just reinforces the um the call to have more women uh in leadership and to have more women at the helm of organizations um right. i've got a couple of questions um that are coming through and i'm going to try and group them but there is one that i want to sneak in before i get to them and okay. that is if if somebody takes a look at your your cv or just does a google read your career seems what's the word you lo- used earlier illogical because it's so yeah. extraordinary you you know you go off you're in the US you ascend to vice president in that organization in no time you come back you are uh, you join the DBSA you are leading a project finance portfolio which is no small portfolio you go to Shanduka you're there as CEO you set up Sigma Capital you're now the CEO of Nespa South Africa it's it's the kind of stuff that books are written about here's my question if you could have changed one thing about yeah. your journey what would that have been i think i would have it, um taken more um more uh opportunities that would have given me more of a global exposure um because i think we we operate in an environment and and you would know this nozipo with your work um we we operate in a global environment and i think yeah. um sometimes we can get so um sucked into our local environments and make our local environments the globe um mm. and, and there are so many cultures so many different environments out there that we can be able to add value to um that we can provide um additional input into and so you know i think it's it's it i would have it created more but then at the same time it was a time when it was um the it was the mid 90s um and it was an exciting time to be in in south africa so you know um there was also that um but you know i think i think having access and exposure to uh global opportunities is something that's important because yeah. 
Um, when you look at any issue, whether it's it's issues in in the well, particularly when I look at our industry in the in the tech industry, it's 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 global issues. Um, it's about who's going to come up with with the next big thing. Is you know in AI, is it you know so 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 we. I, I think exposure to what's happening in globally is, is something that's important for us to be able to expose ourselves into. I love that. I love how you say that my local environment is not the globe. And I yeah. can see how we can make that mistake of yeah. elevating the context we find ourselves in and with its constraints and mm. extrapolating that to the rest of the world when there's so much out there that we can learn from that we can then bring into the local environment. I Absolutely. want to ask you... I want to ask you Dumi's question. Uh, Dumi says, how does Putti deal with fear? Especially if and when she finds herself in spaces that she's unfamiliar and mm. yet expected to deliver mm. on arrival. How do you, how, is that fearful for you? Let's maybe start there. When you arrive and then there's an expectation and then how do you deal with it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've, I've had so many moments like that and, and, and times like that. I mean, I remember when I was on stage with President Clinton, like, I mean, it was like, and it was just after um, I'd had the stroke. Like, I mean, it's like, you're not in your best form and then you're speaking on a panel with President Clinton. It was ridiculous, you know? <laughs> and, and, and I think, you know, it's, 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 it's times like this when my faith has, has really helped me. Uh, believing that I'm there for a purpose. Um, and so therefore having that, when you have that confidence, that self-confidence, it affords you the ability to be calm. And when you calm, mm. you're able to think more mm. rationally and speak in a more rational fashion, as opposed to mm in that sense of fear and and what you find when you're fearful is that you're in a hurry you're you're scared you want to finish you want to yeah. you know but when you are when you have that confidence you can be calm and you can do things in in a manner that is is is, is a lot more humane a lot more mm. you know um so so i think that's you know that that's what has, has really helped me just being able to constantly make that con that connection um, spiritually from my perspective. Sure. Yeah. sure, that's so powerful because I think sometimes we underestimate uh, the importance of being able to anchor yourself back to being calm because yeah. we do operate from up here when we're feeling scared and feeling nervous and feeling judged and feeling the heat of the spotlight. And I just thought it would be interesting to share that, um, you know, there's a, there's a case study that um, is about the All Blacks. Uh, okay. that is done by an organization called LRMG that I chair. And yeah. they talk about how the All Blacks, their winning streak um, yeah. in rugby was actually because of work they did in psychology around how to stay blue-headed in yeah. red moments. And wow. red moments are those moments where we are, you know, we are confronted, we are being challenged, we are on the spotlight, we're being attacked, or we feel we're being attacked. Yeah. And how to be consciously able to say, I'm going to put on my blue head and I'm going to stay in a blue headed zone in order to me to, and I love the word you use to even mm -hmm. the decisions you make are more humane, more calculated, more strategic, more connected to other people. And you don't shut down conversations because you're fearful in act actual fact, when you're blue headed, you open up and you yeah. get input and you get guidance. And so I think it's a great case study for anybody who is interested. So, you, you're absolutely cup, correct. I mean, it, it reminds me of the Rugby World Cup. I mean, when you think of some of the players, like our, our players, like going into, you know, they, they would take these positions where it looked so scary, but they have the ability to do it because they believed in it, yeah. you know? So that, it, it, that's incredible to hear. Thank you for sharing yeah, that. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. And Queen, I don't, I wonder if this is the Queen that I know, but Queen at the Mlambo is yeah. saying, how do you bounce back? putty in where, yeah. where you've messed up and it could be anything right it can be a personal yeah. mess up it can be a professional mess up what what is your bounce back formula um what yeah. do you do to bring yourself back into the game well i think because i i recognize the fact that in a situation where there's any form of calamity or you know uh misunderstanding at, at the very least um it, it's gonna at a minimum take two people 
Um, mm. and, and, and so there's different uh, points of views around that particular situation. Um, and, and I think what, what I've learned is that when you are able to humble yourself and to be willing to listen to the other side, because it actually strengthens you when you can listen mm. to the other, other side and understand what their situation is, because then you can relate it back to your viewpoint. And then you are able to come to a decision that, that makes a little bit more sense. Um, but humility is something that has, um, it, 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 it really works a lot, um, particularly in, in professional environments where um, people tend to, you know, kind of not um, have, always have a lot of humility. Um, but it, it really helps to be able to be willing to just be just slightly um, more humble um, mm. and, 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 and willing to just take that step back to listen a bit more. Um, and because what you find is that you might not win that battle, but yeah. the war you will win. And, and ultimately, that's what you want, right? I absolutely, I mean, I love that. And again, I'm, I'm just, I mean, I, I talk about this poet all the time, uh, David White. He yeah. talks about humility as an invitation to come to ground. Because mm -hmm. the, the word humility, the root of the word is humus. Um, and the word, the, and, and from the same root of the word humus comes, is the word ground, which in Greek mythology, humus means ground. So he says, mm. when you've been humbled, yeah. um, it is not so much a failure, but it is an opportunity, as you've said, to yeah. actually come to ground, to, to come with that humility, to begin to say, what is this moment here to teach me? What is yeah. this moment here to gift me? And you can't hear that mm. unless you've come to ground and you've allowed yourself to be grounded. And I think it's just such a beautiful way of really unlocking some of what you've shared with us um, again. There's, yeah. I want to scroll and uh, hopefully my team can assist me here. There was a beautiful question um, yeah. that came through. Oh, there it is from Naledi. Naledi is asking, um, she's saying, Puti, um, mm. how difficult has it been to lead and to show up in your soft feminine posture in a male dominant, dominated environment? And, mm. and maybe you can, as a precursor to that, is that something that you intentionally think about and do that, how I show up in male dominate spaces and, and how I carry my femininity? So, so actually, interestingly enough, it reminds me of a time when, you know, when I, I was still, um, you know, developing in my uh, professional career. And um, I, and I had this, this role where I was now for the first time overseeing um, this team of people and and I, because of the the type of leadership that I had had, um, I had learned and believed that one needed to behave in a quite an aggressive, um, you know, uh, quite a very, very different um, type of tone. Um, and 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 so I did. And at the time, I'd actually just left um, the U.S. I was here in South Africa, um, and so I was leading in in in, in that way. And um, and and what I found was that it was it, it was very difficult. I remember within a couple of months of me taking up this job, I had like um, over fifty percent of my team on different um, you know performance reviews, all sorts of issues that I had with with all these team members, um, mm -hmm. and 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 so I had to learn to to be a, a different type of leader and at the time that you know in my mind i was thinking there was something wrong with all of these people you know of course it, it, it couldn't yeah. be me it was you, you know it, it had to be um you, you know to to be them but um i i you know and, and i remember i was called in by my then um you know director at the time and um and she said to me um you know putty is everything okay you know <laughs> I said, with what? She said, well, you know, I'm just a little bit concerned. Like, you know, over half of your team is like, you know, on, on some kind of performance. Like uh, there's, there's all sorts of, of issues that, that you appear to be having. What's, what's, what's going on? Um, and, and, and so I said, well, it's, you know, obviously there's, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I don't know what, what, what happened there. I just don't have people who are motivated, who are, you know, um, but the, the problem was really with me. 
I mm. hadn't developed the leadership uh, capability at that time to be able to lead those people in, in, in the right manner. So I had taken on um, a very different type of style of leadership, which was not conducive to being able to have um, the right type of professional environment mm. uh, that I needed to have. And so I had to learn. I had to learn how to be a leader and um, to, 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 and, and, and to be a lot more comfortable with myself right. as well. Because when you lead in a particular type of way, you're actually not really comfortable with who you are because it's almost as if you, when you leave home, you put on a type of mask, then you go to the office and you act out in, in line with that particular mask. Then you go home and it's like, phew, I can be myself yeah. again. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and 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 I think having gone through um, that process, and it, it it was very interesting because it wasn't a, a professional process, but I actually it was a a personal personal experiences that I went mm. through. Um, I met with with certain people, um, and you know, and 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 saw different women leaders and the way that they led, and it was quite surprising because it was very different from the type of women leaders that I had seen um, and you know had you know reported into before, and 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 so I had to relearn and unlearn yeah. um, certain yeah. behaviors. Yeah. Sure. I mean, listening to that is just so, so powerful because I'm listening into the, the openness to, yeah. to, to turn the mirror, to, to turn the spotlight on yourself. Yeah. And the openness to go, oh, this is a me thing. Yeah. I need to do the changing. It's not everybody around me that needs to change and the environment that needs to change um, and the capacity to actually take that in. Um, I really, really, you know, I find that absolutely inspiring because I think we're all a combination of light and shadow and yeah. anything in excess turns from light into a shadow. And every now and then we just need somebody to tap us on the shoulder and say, look, you have the opportunity to be a light, but you're showing up as a shadow because you're doing this. And this is the result uh, that it's eliciting from the people around you. And I think it's hard as a leader when you are at that position where everybody's looking to you to be the perfect leader, forgetting that you're also a human. And that you mm. have to unlearn certain things because everything comes from where we, you know, we journey with certain things and they show up in the way yeah. we lead people. No, it's it's true. And and Nozipo, one of the realities is that often people get promoted because of their capabilities, but you know, their professional capabilities in terms of the work that they do, but not in terms of their capabilities as leaders. Um, mm. So often that that is something that can be taken uh, for granted. But it's so important that when people are being promoted into leadership roles, that enough time is taken to consider the leadership capability of the person versus their capability with respect to that particular type of work that, that needs to be done. Sure. So measuring mm -hmm. not just what people do, but how they yeah. lead with other people. Ex Right. Absolutely. 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 So I know I have got two minutes left. I promised you that we were going to have this conversation for 45 minutes. So yeah. I've got my last two minutes. And what I would love to do in the last two minutes is maybe just give you, I'm going to do one question and then I'm going to give you an opportunity just to give us any parting words to all. And there, there are gentlemen on the uh, listening in as well. I've seen so many uh, gentlemen on. The, the last question is this. It, mentorship, I think, has been very clear that it's been it's very important. It's a very important way of um, breaking through to your professional next. I'd love yeah. for you to comment about whether you've been mentored by anyone intentionally, what impact did that have in your life? But maybe the second part of that question is, how do you then transition from mentorship to sponsorship, which is mm. what a lot of mentees are looking for from mentors mm. within their organizations? Mm. Well, you know, so so, so I, um, you know, I I I had people who um, who mentored me, but I also had people that I looked up to that I didn't know. Or well, I didn't know. I just knew what I had read about of them, them. Um, mm. and I had had the opportunity to actually be formally mentored uh, by them. So there was that element, um, and then I did have people who who mentored me. 
I think with respect to mentoring um, and, and, and sponsorship, I think that as you know, that as you progress in your career, you you actually need both. You need people mm. who are playing a mentoring role and you need people who are playing a sponsoring role. I think sponsors are critical in terms of your growth and development because they're the ones who create the opportunities. They actively create opportunities for you within your organization. Um, and so they they have a, um, a critical role to play there. Um, and then mentors will continuously be guiding you. Um, and, and so I, I was very fortunate to, to, to have sponsors. Um, one of those was um, Andrew Kapitman when I was in, in New York. Um, and, and he played an important role in me going from being um, a, a meant, uh, you know, an intern um, in the organization to then being considered as, as a professional in the organization and then, you know, growing further yeah. within the organization. So he was my sponsor there. But I've had many um, other sponsors throughout my career and many of them have actually been men. Um, but, mm. you know, yeah, yeah. No, thank you very much. I think it's such an important, uh, it's always important to lift up the bridges that help us walk more confidently <laughs> confidently towards our goal. And I often hear that a lot of women are, are mentored and sponsored by men. We don't have the capacity to discuss it here today, but I do hope that it's a question that I'll leave with everyone as well. Um, I'm excited to be part of you know, um, uh, the, the YLC and IWFSA programs where women are intentionally mentoring other women. But what yes. I can say for sure is we need a lot more of it uh, than than what we do have. So thank you again for highlighting this. So as I as I as I hand over to you, just to maybe in thirty seconds, what is, yeah. what would be a parting shot that you would say to the many professionals uh, who look up to you, look up to your journey, who are inspired by you, who've logged on because they believe that um, through just sharing the story of your life, you can give to them something that allows them to live their stories more confidently and to be the heroes of their own stories while they do it. Please believe in yourselves. Believe in yourselves, not only for you, but for the rest of us. Because by you believing in yourself, you can be able to reach out for much bigger opportunities. You'll have the confidence to reach out for those and, and to be able to, to take those on and to be able to face the frustrations and challenges that come your way as, as you go up the ranks. Um, it, we need that. Um, and always remember that it's not just about you becoming the next CEO of a, a, you know, a corporate company or the next owner of a big um, entrepreneurial venture that you will have started um, or, or, or the next uh, you know, scientist, whatever the case is, but it's for the many, many millions of people that will be able to benefit from that. So, you know, we need leaders. And, and the reality is, and, and this is something that I grew up with, that we are all here for a purpose. Let us please have the, the, the guts and the ability to be able to live out that which is within us. It's, it's in me. It's in you. It's in each one of every and every one of us. We just need to have the confidence to stand up and to be able to be willing to be counted amongst the leaders and to do our part to get there. Thank you so much, Pruti. Believe in you for you, but believe in you for us. Yes. I couldn't have closed it on a better note. I am so thankful for your time. Thank you so, 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 so very much, Siabonga. We appreciate you so much. And take Thank good care. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. -bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.